Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to talk about selection and population genetics part one of this slideshow. Um, so if you want to follow along, go ahead, take that out. If you want to fill out the notes as we go, go ahead and pull that out as well. So let's get started. So first up, here we have a population of bunnies. Population, remember, is the same species in the same area, and they can interbreed. Now, um, with our, I'm going to move this up a little bit. With our bunnies here, they're going to go ahead and populate, interbreed, mix up those uh, genes a little bit. And here comes our favorite predator, the owl. And the owl is going to, as we know, pick on those bunnies that stand out. Those green camouflage ones are going to stay very happy and alive. They're going to pass on their genes and continue to interbreed. Now it's going to keep going through the generations until once again, our friend the owl is hungry. They're gonna pick on a brand new rabbit to choose. And lo and behold, we have an all white one. It's most likely going to grab that one for a lunch. Yum, yum, yum. And what we're seeing here is natural selection directly acting on either the genotype or phenotype. So which one do you think it is going to act on directly, genotype or phenotype? In fact, we are directly acting on that phenotype. The color of the rabbit, that physical expression of the trait is what's being uh, selected for in this example. The bunnies that can camouflage have the green phenotype are going to survive, pass on those green genes. The bunnies that are uh, white, they stand out, they're not going to camouflage very well. They're going to be eaten and not pass on those white bunny genes. So natural selection, selection here is directly acting on the phenotype of our organisms. Now let's do the same situation, except we're looking at we, what we call the gene pool. The gene pool are all of the genes in a population and their alleles. So here I've put our genotypes on our bunnies to represent um, the alleles for their respective phenotypes. In this example, we're going to say that green is a dominant uh, uh, allele here, and white is recessive. Now, both of these two bunnies, recessive and dominant, are going to be homozygous to start. Once they start intermingling, interbreeding, getting friendly, uh, we're going to get some mixes up here. Uh, we're going to have some that are heterozygotes, some that are still homozygotes, and Look at this population here. It looks like our heterozygotes and one homozygous dominant are mostly green. They're gonna be fine when this owl is hungry. This owl is going to go ahead and eat up that white bunny. Now they're gonna do it again, interbreed. We're getting more and more of these heterozygotes. And what we're seeing is that natural selection indirectly acts on the what? Genotype or phenotype of organisms. Well, since our um, phenotypes are created by our genotypes, indirectly, that natural selection is acting on our genotype of our organisms or our bunnies in this situation. Because the green camouflage is dominant, the heterozygotes, which what we have here are our heterozygous bunnies, our heterozygotes are still displaying that dominant trait for camouflage. So we're seeing a sort of push, a selection for these more camouflaged green bunnies. And their genotypes in their gene pool happen to be selecting also for that heterozygousness um, or the green allele and the, gene, uh, the genotypes that correspond with those green phenotypes. Um, next, we're gonna watch a short video um, if you're following along at home, you want to watch it on your own, uh, or if you uh, want to watch it without uh, this little Ed puzzle here that I'm making, go ahead, click on this image. You should get a link. Um, I already have the window open, but if you click on the picture, a little link shows up and it'll take you to this YouTube video. So let's go ahead and watch it.
The Five Fingers of Evolution. A thorough understanding of biology requires a thorough understanding of the process of evolution. Most people are familiar with the process of natural selection. However, this is just one of five processes that can result in evolution. Before we discuss all five of these processes, we should define evolution. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. But what is a gene pool? And for that matter, what is a gene? Before spending any more time on genetics, let us begin with a story. Imagine that a boat capsizes and 10 survivors swim to shore on a deserted island. They are never rescued and they form a new population that exists for thousands of years. Strangely enough, five of the survivors have red hair. Red hair is created when a person inherits two copies of the red gene from their parents. If you only have one copy of the gene, you won't have red hair. To make this easier, we will assume that the five non-redheads are not carriers of the gene. The initial frequency of the red hair gene is therefore 50%, or 10 of 20 total genes. These genes are the gene pool. The 20 different genes are like cards in a deck that keep getting reshuffled with each new generation. Sex is simply a reshuffling of the genetic deck. The cards are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The deck remains the same, 50% red. The genes are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The gene pool remains the same, 50% red. Even though the population may grow in size over time, the frequency should stay at about 50%. If this frequency ever varies, then evolution has occurred. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. Think about it in terms of the cards. If the frequency of the cards in the deck ever changes, evolution has occurred. There are five processes that can cause the frequency to change. To remember these processes, we will use the fingers on your hand, starting from the little finger and moving to the thumb. The little finger should remind you that the population can shrink. If the population shrinks, then chance can take over. For example, if only four individuals survive an epidemic, then their genes will represent the new gene pool. The next finger is the ring finger. This finger should remind you of mating because a ring represents a couple. If individuals choose a mate based on their appearance or location, the frequency may change. If redheaded individuals only mate with redheaded individuals, they could eventually form a new population. If no one ever mates with redheaded individuals, these genes could decrease. The next finger is the middle finger. The M in the middle finger should remind you of the M in the word mutation. If a new gene is added through mutation, it can affect the frequency. Imagine a gene mutation creates a new color of hair. This would obviously change the frequency in the gene pool. The pointer finger should remind you of movement. If new individuals flow into an area or immigrate, the frequency will change. If individuals flow out of an area or emigrate, then the frequency will change. In science, we refer to this movement as gene flow. All four of the processes represented by our fingers can cause evolution. Small population size, non-random mating, mutations, and gene flow. However, none of them lead to adaptation. Natural selection is the only process that creates organisms better adapted to their local environment. I use the thumb to remember this process. Nature votes thumbs up for adaptations that will do well in their environment and thumbs down to adaptations that will do poorly. The genes for individuals that are not adapted for their environment will gradually be replaced by those that are better adapted. Red hair is an example of one of these adaptations. Red hair is an advantage in the northern climates because the fair skin allowed ancestors to absorb more light and synthesize more vitamin D. Thumbs up. However, this was a disadvantage in the more southern climates where increased UV radiation led to cancer and decreased fertility. Thumbs down. Even the thumb itself is an adaptation form through the process of natural selection. The evolution that we have described is referred to as microevolution because it refers to a small change. However, this form of evolution may eventually lead to macroevolution or speciation. Every organism on the planet shares ancestry with a single common ancestor. All living organisms on the planet are connected back in time through the process of evolution. Take a look at your own hand. It's an engineering masterpiece that was created by the five processes I just described over millions and millions of years. Can you recall the five main causes of evolution from memory? If you can't, hit rewind and watch that part again. But if you can, give yourself or your neighbor a big five-fingered high five.
right, so we're going to quickly go through some of those five fingers um, in our slideshow. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about that little finger one um, that reminds us of small populations. So if a population shrinks, so let's take uh, one near and dear to our hearts, it's happening right now, the coronavirus. Um, let's say we have a population and the coronavirus is way more deadly than it has been and it wipes out, gosh, 75% of the population on Earth of humans. We're left with 25% of the people. Whatever those 25% of the people are is our new gene pool. So we'll have a smaller population and that new population will represent the new frequency of genes in our gene pool. It could be um, people in a different country or it could be a few people in a bunch of countries. If the population shrinks, our gene pool will change. So the relative frequency changes because we're reducing that number of species with a specific allele. In the video, we talked about red hair. Um, if all those survivors of that um, awful pandemic in the video had no red hair, the new gene pool will not have that red hair allele. We're seeing a change in that gene pool because the population shrank. Um, next up, our ring finger one, non-random mating. So ring finger, that's the, the hand you put or the finger you put rings on when you get married. Um, so sort of like a, a memory trick there, a mnemonic. My mate was probably not selected randomly. Desirable individuals mate more frequently. If I look at that dude over there and he is really good looking, I'm likely to mate with him because he has desirable features. If uh, that, if I, you know, I'm interested in someone who's not as good looking, but a better, nicer person, again, my choice is being influenced. It's not just like I'm choosing a random dude out of a hat. No, I'm looking for traits that I find desirable. The frequency in our gene pool will change because we're increasing the number of offspring with those desirable traits or alleles. So if I really like that handsome guy over there, his handsome genes are likely to continue down. If I don't care about looks and I want that really nice guy over there, great. Then that guy's nice genes are going to be passed on. Most often mating is not random, especially in animals. All right, next up our middle finger, M for mutation. This is when we're all pretty familiar with when a new genotype is introduced into the gene pool. So let's say, for example, we have our um, blue guy over here and our orange guy over here. Then we get a mutation that causes this yellow. Ooh, weird, it's super dominant. Now, anyone who mates with this yellow guy, their offspring will be yellow because it is dominant, super dominant. Um, and that will change the frequency of alleles in the gene pool because we're adding a new, a new type, a new genotype. Um, a great example would be that fruit fly CER, our curly wings. They were a mutation, but they happen to be dominant. So now whenever those wild type flies mated, that dominant mutation of curly wings took over. It changed the gene pool. Um, next up, our pointer finger, the one about movement. Gene flow is about movement when alleles go from one to another. Let's say um, one, one of these orange guys leaves and goes across here. We are reducing the number of orange guys in this population and we're increasing the number of orange guys in this population. We've changed the frequency of alleles in each gene pool. Immigration, emigration. Um, this orange guy would be emigrating over here, or immigrating into this new place. Emigrating, leaving this side, immigrating on this side. Now, instead of just one blue guy on this side, we have a blue guy and a orange guy here. We have one fewer orange guy to contribute to this gene pool on the right. So we're changing the gene pool in that sense. Lastly here, uh, our natural selection, our thumb. Natural forces indirectly select for which alleles survive the gene pool. So this is a lot like our bunnies in the very beginning. Thumbs up for adaptations. So my room, uh, I know we haven't been in there yet, but it is often very, very cold. 
Well, this guy right here, oh no, they don't have a phenotype that can adapt to those cold environments. They are vulnerable, they will die out. Now, half of the blue guys are dead. That changed the frequency of those uh, alleles in our gene pool. We selected naturally which alleles remained, the ones that could survive that cold Ms. Ratliff's room. So just to recap, evolution is a change in a gene pool over time. If everything stays the same, no evolution has occurred. We can see this evolution using those five fingers. The small population, if that population shrinks, there's some catastrophic event, for example. COVID hits, it's a pandemic, and 75% of the population dies. That 25% that's left over, those survivors, they have now all of the genes for humans. They are the new gene pool. Whatever they have is now 100% of the human genes. We've changed that gene pool. That 25% of the population isn't a great representation of what the 100% was before. So we've changed. Uh, second, non-random mating, desirable individuals mate more frequently. Makes sense. You have a trait I like, I wanna mate with you so that my offspring have that trait that I like. It's desirable. Mutations, the new genotype is introduced, those curly wings on our fruit flies. Now, since it's super dominant, we're going to change that gene pool. Whenever that mutated fruit fly uh, reproduces, it's going to produce curly winged uh, offspring, changing our frequency in the gene pool. Uh, fourth, our gene flow. When genes go from one gene pool to another, immigration and emigration. If um, some blue guys on this side travel over to this side, we have fewer blue guys in the original gene pool and more blue guys in the new gene pool. And lastly, our natural selection. When natural forces indirectly select which alleles survive. So with that indirect um, effect on the genotypes, thumbs up to adaptation. Whatever survives means that it's more fit to survive and it will change our, our, our gene pool here. Those that are not as fit and they die out, their alleles are no longer in that gene pool. We see a change. All right, that's all I got for this video. Um, see you all tomorrow.